All right, good evening or uh, morning, depending on your time zone. Um, glad to have you back for the uh, final session of our traumatic brain injury uh, student uh, seminar series. Um, this grand round uh, session delivered by Dr. Uzma Samadani is gonna focus on uh, the future of neurosurgery, the robots are coming, a uh, very timely topic given everything in the news about AI and robotics in, uh, in medical care. Um, Dr. Samadani is a leading neurosurgeon and a neurotrauma expert um, affiliated with the University of Minnesota and with uh, the VA uh, Medical Center in Minneapolis. Um, she's also the founder of a neurodiagnostic startup, Oculogica, which we'll talk a little bit about during this talk. Um, Dr. Samadani um, has had multiple uh, leadership positions in the AANS, CNS, uh, and the National Neurotrauma Society. She also serves as the president-elect of the uh, Think First Foundation, as well as the chair of the Minnesota State Traumatic Brain and Spinal Cord Injury Research Program. So really can't think of a better person to have uh, give this, this Grand Rounds talk um, and something that will be you know, unique in terms of the topic. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Samadani. Thanks for having me. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, we're going to talk about the future of brain injury. So I could have I could have talked about the future of all of neurosurgery. That's too broad. Uh, neurotrauma again, too broad. Um, brain injury still too broad. But I'm going to give it a shot. Um, and the title of my talk is "Are We Ready for the Robots?" Because I think that's what's coming. Uh, the reality is is that neurosurgery is not going to be practiced the way it was ten years ago. Uh, in the future. And so you guys will get to be part of that, that excitement. These are my disclosures. And as he mentioned, I do have some intellectual property as well as a number of outside funding sources that have funded my work both in the past and in the current present. Um, so if you Google traumatic brain injury and you guys have may already have uh, had multiple lectures on traumatic brain injury, you know that it's the current classification scheme is mild, moderate and severe. And it's a function of Glasgow Coma Scale score, uh, how long the patient's amnestic, and whether or not they have a, a particular duration of loss of consciousness. And so this classification scheme is widely acknowledged. Uh, there was a large NASEM paper, uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, paper about how GCS is a useful technique for classifying the nature of brain injury. And the reality is, is that this classification scheme actually doesn't tell you anything about the pathophysiology or prognosis of brain injury, or it tells you relatively little. Because the problem is, is that loss of consciousness can occur for many reasons. And sometimes you have a patient, for example, who's found down, and it turns out that they have a brain injury, but they are perceived as being intoxicated, or they're found down and they're perceived as, um, as not having a brain injury, and actually they, they, they don't, they are intoxicated. So, you know, you can imagine that this can be a, a confounding factor. Uh, polytrauma can also confound whether or not there's a, a brain injury. Uh, loss of consciousness can occur just from a change in blood pressure, for example, or from a change in respiratory status. A lack of loss of consciousness does not always equate with milder injury, either short or long-term. And so here's a classic example. This is a CT scan of a 37-year-old woman who had fallen two weeks prior. She fell at home. She did not have a loss of consciousness. She ultimately, two weeks later, developed a headache and word-finding difficulty, went to the emergency room, and here you can see the CAT scan that shows the large subdural. So she has a potentially fatal injury that, if left untreated, would be fatal, but she never qualified for mild, moderate, or severe. She never had an alteration in GCS, she was never amnestic, and she never had loss of consciousness. She ultimately went to the operating room two weeks after the injury, but you're sort of left with, well, how do we classify this? Is this mild, moderate, or severe? It's potentially life-threatening, but she never even met the definition of mild. Uh, so why is concussion or brain injury in general so hard to diagnose and define? Well, part of the problem is that no two brain injuries are the same. I always think of brain injury as a salad, and it's a salad with multiple ingredients. And those ingredients consist of different pathophysiologies. So many patients, approximately one-fifth of patients with brain injury, also have comorbid neck injury. 
So they have a whiplash effect. They have a flexion extension. They have vestibular dysfunction uh, from disruption of the utricle or saccules of the inner ear. They can have endocrine dysfunction. So this is classically a patient who's in a car accident at high speed and the car, maybe they're wearing a seatbelt and the car comes to a rapid uh, a deceleration and the head flexes and extends and they never impact, right? They're in their seatbelt. They never impact the windshield. They come into the ER. Maybe a head CT is ordered just because, you know, they're a polytrauma, but there's, there's nothing there. And then they end up having endocrine dysfunction later. And it turns out that they sheared their uh, hypophyseal axis. Uh, there's also other mechanisms of injury that are invisible, something like cortical spreading depression, which is also called, called spreading depolarizations. So what that is, is when you have a patient who sustains a brain injury and they sometimes they're initially asymptomatic and they have a very focal disruption in ion channels, in neurons in a particular area of the brain. And then what happens is that over time, as they're trying to compensate for that focal disruption, they experience what's called kindling, which means that that spreading depolarization sort of get, develops in a larger area. And that can ultimately lead to uh, post-concussive migraine. It can lead to seizures. Uh, it can even lead to stroke. And we now know that this is probably one of the most common causes of post-concussive migraine or post-traumatic brain injury, uh, migraine or headache. Uh, and this is something that's put, that may be invisible on the initial scan. Uh, then there's the, the stuff that you can see. You can see a scalp injury. You can see on CT a skull injury. You can see bleeding above or below the dura in the subarachnoid space in the intraventricular space. Sometimes on MRI, you can see diffuse axonal injury, which is stretching or tearing of neurons. And often you cannot acutely see, but you can later see anoxic brain injury. And this has the worst prognosis. So, you know, imagine that all of this is happening simultaneously in the patient at the time of trauma. You know, you may have a car accident and the patient experiences a visible scalp injury, uh, a visible skull injury, a tiny little bit of subarachnoid, traumatic subarachnoid blood, but then the part that you don't see may be the part that may, is most disabling. Maybe they also had a femur fracture or a spleen rupture and their blood pressure dropped and their blood pressure dropped so much they weren't oxygenating their brain. And the real injury is the anoxic brain injury. So think of brain injury as a salad and you're trying to figure out the ingredients, some of which have different prognoses and all of which have different treatments. What else makes brain injury so hard to diagnose and define? No two recoveries are the same. So you have very plastic um, brains in some people and less so in others. You have varying degrees of resilience. We know that there are genetic and environmental contributors. So catechol O-methyltransferase alleles, BDNF levels, APOE, uh, retinoic acid receptor. So this is a picture of Kevin Pierce, who's a famous snowboarder. And for those of you who haven't seen it, you should watch the movie Crash Reel because in it, they show uh, Kevin uh, having a brain injury and then recovering. And what's very apparent from the very beginning of the movie is that Kevin is not a normal person. He is extraordinarily resilient. And that's why he probably recovers as well as he does. So you've got the genetics of brain injury. You've got factors that increase your risk for having a brain injury. You've got factors that increase your risk for having an acute impact from that injury, acute edema, um, delayed uh, complications, secondary consequences of the brain injury, and then finally factors that increase your likelihood for long-term chronic effects of neurotrauma. So you've got a number of different genetic risk factors that impact recovery from brain injury. So you can have two people with the exact same brain injury have completely different outcomes just because of the genetics. What else makes it challenging? Some people with brain injury were never hit in the head. They can have a blast component. They can have an inertial component. There can be other mechanisms that don't necessarily leave a physical scar or a, a visible finding on MRI, but still leave a brain injury. So ultimately, you're in a position where neither imaging nor loss of consciousness tell the whole story. So there's what you see on imaging, which is the yellow circle. There's loss of consciousness, which in the Venn diagram partially overlaps. And then there's the elephant in the room, which is physiologic brain injury. And that consists of multiple pathophysiologies. So things like um, iron toxicity, that happens with microhemorrhage, where the heme component of hemoglobin breaks down and causes cellular apoptosis. Astroglial scarring happens after blast. This happens years later. So you can imagine that 
This is a very, very complicated problem. Well, what do you do when you have a complicated problem? You use something like machine learning or artificial intelligence. So back in the day when I was in high school and college, we used conventional science. And how did that work? It was hypothesis driven, right? You, you had a hypothesis that giving insulin would fix your blood glucose levels. And then you did experiments often in mice and you, you tested the, um, the, the likely outcomes or your hypotheses with conventional statistics. How does machine learning work? Machine learning doesn't work the same way at all. For one thing, you don't need to understand the model. You don't need to understand the relationship between insulin and glucose levels. You, it, it sometimes is a much more complicated relationship. And that's what's true with brain injury. Here you've got genetic factors, you've got environmental factors, and you've got a pathophysiology that's incredibly complex. It has at least 12 different mechanisms. So ultimately, you're not going to be able to figure that out with conventional pathophysiologic pathophysio approaches. You have to use something like machine learning. You have to have complex equations where some of the variables are not predictable or understood. You don't necessarily need to understand that, but you ultimately need to test it on an independent data set. How does this become an artificial intelligence when it starts to mimic human intelligence? So what's a classic example? Well, when you walk into the grocery store, I hate to tell you this, but when you walk into the grocery store, they sometimes know exactly who you are. They know how many times you've been there and they know what you usually buy and how much money you spend. They use face recognition software. Why do they do this? Because it saves them money. They know that you're not a pickpocker, pickpocket, pickpocket, and they know that you're not, you know, there to, to cause nefarious problems. So ultimately, my question is, is how soon, when, how, when are we going to get to the point when you can roll into the ER and we can know everything about you, you know, just as instantly as they know it from face recognition software in the grocery store? My argument for this lecture is going to be that ultimately ro robots will augment and possibly even replace doctors. And I'm going to take you through this. I'm going to talk about how this will begin with diagnostics like physical exam, radiology, and pathology, and ultimately include therapeutics such as surgery. So neurosurgery, as we practice it, will not be the same. And that's probably a good thing because we're dealing with, in, in brain injury in particular, a very complicated problem that's not going to respond to conventional approaches. So how will diagnostics change? I, I would suspect that diagnostics will be first. Well, here's a CT scan. This is, for example, the first thing that happens when a patient comes in with brain injury. You get a history and physical exam if they're awake. Um, and sometimes that's very abbreviated because you know they may have a blown pupil, they may have obvious corneal signs, they may have an obvious head lack, they may be intubated and unstable. So what's the first thing you wanna do? You wanna figure out what's going on inside the head. Well, what are some of the ways that images can be analyzed? So here you have a technology called BLAST-CT, which was actually developed um, using a deep learning algorithm. And what it does is it segments different types of pathology in the brain. It segments hematoma, it segments edema, and it, it localizes them to different regions. And then you can ultimately classify the nature of brain injury. And I'm gonna show you an example of how our lab has used this in just a moment. What else do you have? You have serum markers. So serum markers are currently used for things like heart attack, right? Because you can check a troponin level. It's used for things like PE. You can check D-dimers. You, you know, you can figure out if someone's having a DVT on the basis of their clotting factors. Well, what can you tell about brain injury? You can tell about the nature of brain injury. You can tell about the cell types that are disrupted. Are they neural cells? Are they glial cells? Um, different markers can inform regarding different types of cellular injury. And this is work that's from TRAC TBI, uh, which is a large uh, a multi-center study. I'm sure you guys have heard about it because you've already been talking about brain injury. So you have your ictus of injury, and then you have your time course where different markers can inform regarding different um, phases of injury. Um, so what can you do with this? You can actually map the UCHL1 and GFAP levels in traumas acutely, and you can compare them, for example, to spontaneous hemorrhage, to cardiac or respiratory arrest, which are these asterisks in yellow, um, and to CT negative high velocity trauma, which are these purple squares, 
And then uh, to controls, these are people who were not traumas at all. And what you see is that these serum markers can tell you something about the nature of the injury. So we see that traumas um, have a, a large spectrum of uh, distribution, uh, whereas CT negative high velocity traumas are here. Um, spontaneous hemorrhage, obviously the GFAP seems elevated. Uh, so, you know, there are certain features that can help classify the nature of brain injury. And so ultimately you can combine these things. You can combine serum biomarkers and CT images and you can classify using um, support vector machine learning. Um, this is work from our lab, the difference between, for example, trauma and spontaneous hemorrhage. So if you have a patient who's found down on the basis of serum biomarkers and BLAST CT analysis, you can, you can differentiate between, for example, trauma and spontaneous hemorrhage, trauma and cardiac or respiratory arrest, um, trauma and CT negative high velocity trauma, and then this is controls. So essentially you can figure out what type of injury the patient had algorithmically without ever having a doctor involved. Um, what else can you do? You can prognosticate. So you can look at brain death versus controls, um, uh, CT negative, uh, CT positive and non-trauma patients. Um, and so controls are, for example, patients with headache. And what you find is that you can prognosticate, you can figure out the, the, both the serum levels and the serum levels plus BLAST CT can be combined and they can help you classify the nature of injury. So you can look, for example, at uh, cardiac arrest uh, in versus found down and diffuse axonal injury patients. Um, you know, and brain death can be differentiated from these other uh, types of pathologies. How is this useful? Well, this is useful when you have a patient who comes into the ER and you're trying to figure out, are they drunk? Are they, um, do they actually have a brain injury? You know, and you don't necessarily have to have a human see them. You know, blood can be drawn. Um, you know, they don't even, theoretically, you could replace an exam uh, with something that classifies the nature of injury. And, and, and in, in theory, you could, you could prognosticate this in the future. There are differences in UCHL1 and GFAP between brain dead, brain injured, and control subjects. And so you can see how you can map this out and you can figure it out. Um, and then there are also differences in serum markers among brain dead patients, depending on the mechanism of injury. So cardiac and respiratory arrest, high velocity trauma, and then ones that are found down with an unknown mechanism. And so this can be helpful, for example, in trying to figure out what happened. Um, so what's next? I mean, after, after sort of replacing, um, you know, the radiologist and uh, the physician who, who reads the films, um, well, I would say physical examination will be next. So um, this is something that's very near and dear to me because, you know, we've actually um, started a, a company around this space. But essentially what you can do is you can do a digital neurologic exam by watching how someone's eyes move while they watch television. How can you do a digital neurologic exam? Well, you can measure cranial nerves two and three function because you can look at pupil size. You can measure three, four, and six because you can look at ocular motility. And then you can measure five and seven by looking at blink. So what we do is we have a person, and this is a volunteer in my lab, Talha Mahmoud. Um, he's actually now a resident in New York. Um, and he's watching Puss in Boots, a cartoon. And the cartoon is moving around the perimeter of a video monitor. And as it moves, it goes 10 seconds per side. So it's 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds. And as he's watching that video, there's a camera watching his eyes. And it's measuring things like pupil size and location. Uh, and it's also assessing blink and you know whether or not it can see the pupil. And so as it's doing that, it's assessing function of cranial nerves 2, 3, 3, 4, 6, and 5, and 7. So you can assess the function of half of the cranial nerves just by looking at eye movements. And what do you see? You see that when a patient has a, a cranial nerve palsy, you pick it up. So obviously cranial nerve three innervates in, the superior and inferior rectus. So it moves the pupil up and down and therefore it impacts box height. Cranial nerve six innervates the lateral rectus. So it moves the pupil out to the side. And so it impacts box width. And so we've written a paper basically demonstrating that you can detect this using eye tracking. 
Well, what happens when someone has elevated intracranial pressure? We know that it causes an axonal slowing in the cranial nerves. So here you have a patient with a normal ICP, um, and then their ICP goes up to not even out of the physiologic range, but you can see that there's a difference in the width of the box. And then they get better ultimately, and the ICP is no longer recorded, but you can see that the width of the box goes back to normal. Here's another patient, normal ICP, then it becomes uh, elevated relative to what it was, and then it's not recorded. Um, and so you can see that ultimately you can tell when someone has elevated intracranial pressure, and we've published that. So how is this useful? Well, it's useful for something like concussion. So this is a time course of eye movement. And what we're seeing here is um, we're plotting the Cartesian coordinates of the pupils over time. So in a normal person, when you plot the Cartesian coordinates of the left pupil versus the right pupil in the horizontal plane, which is X, or in the vertical plane, they overlap, right? Because the left eye and the right eye move together in the horizontal plane, and they move together in the vertical plane. So when the video starts, X increases and Y stays the same. The video gets to the top right corner of the monitor, Y decreases and X stays the same, and so on and so forth as the video goes around the perimeter of the screen. So in a normal person, you're gonna see cycles that look like this. When someone's concussed, the eyes do not move together. Um, and so you can see that there is not a direct overlap between the right and left eye in either the horizontal or the vertical plane. And uh, in this particular patient, you see these streaking vertical lines, which we now know are um, suggestive of papilledema. Uh, and then the, as the patient partially recovers, um, you can see that the lines still do not overlap. They still have a disconjugacy. However, the, the other features, the papilledema type features, appear to have disappeared. Um, so what happens as a person recovers from brain injury over time? So this is the distribution of conjugacy in a normal population is in green. So most people have eyes that move together. Uh, and then this is the distribution of a population of people who are injured and initially their, their eye movements are not always conjugate, then they actually get slightly worse before they get better. And then they trend towards normal over time. And so you can see that this is a good way to track recovery after brain injury. And this is something that we've published in the emergency medicine setting and then others have published in a sports medicine setting. Um, how is this useful? Well, what about BLAST? So this is the Minnehaha Academy they had a natural gas explosion. You can see the, the effect of the damage. There were two fatalities, seven patients admitted to the hospital, and 36 exposed survivors were evaluated in our lab with eye tracking and the sport concussion assessment tool. Why did we use that? Because we already had an IRB for it. Um, and the mean age was 35, the range was 13 to 70, and there were 23 females. So school was not in session when this happened. And what we saw was that eye tracking was able to distinguish between individuals exposed to BLAST and age match controls. And there were five metrics that were significantly different between survivors and controls. Um, and so if you look at the heat map of the school, this is the ictus of the BLAST. These are the two fatalities. And the darker red, the circle, the more abnormal the eye tracking. Um, the lighter the circle, the more normal the eye tracking. So the kids who were outside on the soccer field were relatively fine, as were those in the parking lot behind the school. The people who were in the main building or in the gym were most affected. Um, so it correlated with distance from the epicenter of the blast. So to summarize on eye tracking, basically by looking at someone's eye movements, you can perform a digital neurologic exam. It informs regarding cranial nerve function and all of the pathways that feed into the cranial nerves and impact the cranial nerves. So you can imagine that that's a lot of real estate in the brain because there are so many different inputs into those pathways. Um, so ultimately the goal here, I think, is a hierarchical approach to a classification of a problem. And we're, we're not gonna take just one thing. You know, the, yes, I think eye tracking is exciting and it's, it, it's a form of digital neurologic exam. It's not going to replace any form of imaging. You know, imaging will still be performed. CT, you'll have MRI and you'll have serum biomarkers. And ultimately you'll get algorithms and those algorithms will spit out, um, you know, sort of a classification scheme for brain injury. Um, and then what's next? Well, the next step is that ultimately surgery will be algorithmic and automated. 
And how is that, you know, what is that gonna look like? Well, let's, let's talk about a classic example from neurosurgery. Here you have a patient with a chronic subdural, right? Um, these patients are typically in the hospital longer than a brain tumor. In the VA system, they stay a mean of 9.3 days. Um, it's less than a week for a tumor. They have an 11 to 20% recurrence rate. The one-year mortality is almost one-third of patients will be dead. And the mean survival is 4.4 years versus six years from actuarial tables. So it's a bad problem. Um, the incidence is rising as the population ages. And the, the big question is, is can a machine do a smarter surgery than a human? Right now, the way we treat these is we drill a hole in the head and we drain the fluid, right? Well, this is something that an algorithm can identify, right? An algorithm can segment the hematoma, compare it to normal brain, identify the volumetric centroid, and then figure out where the drill needs to go. Um, and ultimately you can optimize the drill site location to reduce residual hematoma because it may turn out that the centroid is not the perfect spot, but rather um, someplace a little bit, uh, you know, dorsal or ventral to the, to the centroid that gives you a better sort of drainage. And, you know, the, the ultimate question is, is at what point will a computer be able to predict this better than a human can? Um, and I would, I would argue that we're already there. Um, according to our data, for example, for this subdural, the sweet spot for drain placement is right here. And so you can see that we've highlighted in purple where the, the drill should be placed in order to optimize drainage of this particular hematoma. Um, so ultimately, you can take your, your CT scans, you can segment them, you can optimize your drill location, you can co-register this to a virtual reality system, and then you can figure out where you're gonna place your drill. Um, so at some point, will we still have humans involved? It's a good question. Right now we do, but there may be a time when we have a surgery robot that will come in and do the surgeries. Um, I would argue that it's not an if, it's a when. Um, there's a patient perception, for example, that robots increase accuracy. Uh, there's a perception that robots increase safety. And we know that hospitals love to save money and cost is a function of volume and time. Ultimately, complex problems demand it, and I think it's inevitable that the robots are going to come more and more to the operating room. Why is this probably a good thing? Well, it's probably a good thing because the way we do medicine right now is often very, very simplistic. So for example, we have a problem called dementia, right? And for years and years and years, everyone assumed that this was a very simple problem. They said that it was called the amyloid hypothesis. They said that it's accumulation of amyloid in the brain that causes these tangles, and that's what causes dementia, right? Um, and the problem was is that they ignored data that showed that sometimes you have patients who don't have amyloid and still have dementia, and sometimes you have patients who have a lot of amyloid and don't have any dementia. So there was a dubious connection to the symptom severity, but there was a general trend that the more amyloid you had, uh, the more likely you were to be demented. Ultimately, they had a problem that they couldn't accurately measure and classify, and therefore they ended up not being able to treat it. Um, the number of medications that have failed um, is, is here. So sites of action of failed therapeutic approaches to Alzheimer's disease. And you can look at people trying to immunize against the plaque, people trying to block fibrils, protofilaments, oligomers, um, you know, aticanumab. So this, this aticanumab was actually approved. Um, very controversial medication. Uh, even Medicare isn't covering it. Um, so, you know, you've got, you've got all these different pathways trying to stop the production of amyloid plaques, and all of them failed. And this is exactly the mistake that most people are making with brain injury, is they are assuming that the chronic effects of neurotrauma are due to a single pathology, which was hyperphosphorylated mislocalized tau. And therefore, if we target that pathology, we'll be able to treat it. And it's a ridiculous idea because I already told you, brain injury is a salad. It's a complex problem. It's got multiple pathophysiologies and there are multiple genetic pathways that feed into it and you're not going to find a single easy solution. Um, and companies are gonna put money into this just like they have for Alzheimer's disease. You know, you can see how much 
how many failed meds there are. I read an economist article about this, and basically it said that companies only need to have one out of every hundred drugs succeed in order to make money, because that's how lucrative a working medication is. So in other words, they don't mind having 99 failed drugs. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's where we are. Ultimately, big data will help. It's going to be needed to solve these big problems. Um, if you look at life expectancy, it is rising everywhere except the United States. Um, this is an old data uh, pre-COVID. And the risk factors for dementia, again, this is a, a slightly old, out of date um, figure. But you know, the early risk factors for dementia, APOE4, less education, hearing loss, hypertension, obesity, smoking, depression, physical inactivity, social isolation, diabetes, all of these risk factors play a role in whether or not someone ends up with dementia. And so that tells you something right there. This is multifactorial, it's complex. These are the same types of factors that are gonna impact whether or not someone experiences chronic effects of neurotrauma. Um, big data can be used to solve big problems. So this is a study, 41,000 patients, 284,000 controls. People who took anticholinergics used for depression, urinary incontinence and Parkinson's had a 30% increased risk of developing dementia. So when you look at 41,000 patients, you can start to figure out these effects. And that's how we're gonna solve these big problems. So how close are we to, you know, when you walk in the grocery store, they know who you are and what you're gonna buy. How close are we to when you walk into the emergency room, we know who you are and how you're gonna do. Well, we're not there yet. Is it possible? I would say it's definitely possible. Um, who's gonna get us there? Well, I would argue that it's the big employers, right? It's the companies that have a vested interest in having a healthy workforce right? And so what's happening in the United States is more and more capital is being vested in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And those fewer and fewer people are going to want to keep their workforce healthy. And so they can ultimately invest in um, these types of algorithms. And these are the people who develop algorithms. I mean, Amazon knows what you're going to buy when you just think about it. Um, you know, Google they, it, you know, there's multiple studies that find that Google finds outbreaks of, you know, any sort of viral infection long before the CDC knows that they exist. And how do they find them? They see that um, people are, are Googling their symptoms. They're saying, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, whatever. And, you know, Google is, is almost like a better public health harbinger than any other mechanism at this point. And, you know, the, the organization there, they've given talks about this. Um, as, as we get more and more conglomeration of, you know, pharma and insurance, it's, it's going to be very, very interesting because these people are going to have all the information. And with that data, they can figure out what sorts of treatments work and what sorts of treatments do not work. Um, you know, already people are, are ignoring their doctors, they're going straight to the internet, and they want direct to consumer solutions. And that's actually, I think, the future of medicine. I think that ultimately, it's not going to be Dr. Samadhani, it's going to be Dr. AI that, that manages these, these diagnoses, that figures out these diagnoses and manages these problems. Um, and to me, this is going to be really interesting because the way modern medicine works right now is that um, someone has to profit in order for something to get incorporated into medical care. Um, if you have something that's a great solution, and you know, suppose I come up with a diagnostic for brain injury and it's the best thing ever, unless the hospital makes money, they're never going to use it. Um, and so when you have big data and you go direct to the consumer, there's no, there's no hospital payment there. And so I think that this is going to change the dynamic of healthcare, and hopefully it's going to rescue it to some extent because it's become a bloated monster. Um, and maybe it will be the end of the FDA hospital clinic system, insurance, and, and Medicare as we know it. Because right now we have an unsustainable system. And for example, suppose, um, suppose Google takes all of its employees and it figures out that, you know, drug X, which is not FDA cleared for this particular indication, massively decreases the risk for, you know, long-term cognitive impairment, right? 
it's perhaps going to say, okay, you know, we're going to make drug X available to all of our employees, you know, starting at age 50 when they become at risk, right? Um, it's not FDA cleared for that indication. Does it matter? You know, does the FDA matter anymore? Um, you know, does, does what the hospital or the physician say matter anymore? You know, these, these are people whose employers are going to be able to control this. Um, they don't need to go through the insurance companies. So I think there's, there's an opportunity for big disruption. What else can change with this? Well, you can change inequities. Um, right now, the way brain injury works, it's an incredibly inequitable disease. Um, and how, why? It's just, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible problem. We know that people of color are twice as likely to die from a brain injury as white people. Um, why is that? Well, number one, they're much less likely to go to the hospital. Um, if, I don't know if you guys have ever read it. Drew Maggery wrote a book called uh, The Night the Lights Went Out. He's a writer. Uh, he, he lives in San Francisco and he writes about football. But he was in New York and something happened and he ended up having a brain injury. And he was wearing a tuxedo. He was at a black tie event and his friends called an ambulance and the ambulance came and they said, well, we think he's just drunk. We don't think he needs to go to the hospital. And his friends insisted. And, you know, this is a white man in a tuxedo. So he ends up ultimately going to the hospital and he gets to the hospital and the, the physicians there say, we don't think he needs a CT. We think he's just drunk. And again, his friends insisted. And then he got the CT and it showed the brain injury. He ended up going for emergency surgery and he ended up getting better. Now imagine that he were black and that he wasn't in a tuxedo and he didn't have friends who wrote for the newspapers. You know, would he even have gone to the hospital? Of course not. He would have been dead, right? So the triage begins even pre-hospital. Um, there, there's a, a greater distrust of the medical care system from certain ethnic minorities and cultural groups because historically they haven't been treated fairly in those environments. And what's more, when they work in those environments, they see the inequities. So of course they don't trust those systems. If you work in a hospital and you see that people who are, are, are people of color get treated very inequitably compared to employees who are white, of course you're not going to want to send your family members to that place when they have an injury. Um, who gets treated aggressively. So the classic example of someone who gets treated aggressively is someone who is educated, someone who's wealthy, um, someone who has resources, and someone who has someone advocating for them. Who doesn't get treated aggressively? Someone who comes in by themselves, someone who doesn't speak English. Um, women, minorities, women in particular tend to be gaslit. Um, they, they tend to be told, oh, your chest pain's nothing. You know, there's a number of studies that have shown that you know, if a male versus a man, uh, woman, a man versus a woman comes into the emergency department with the exact same complaints, they're given a script that the man is much more likely to be worked up. Um, you know, and, and and this is a known fact. Who goes to rehab? Um, it's not a function of your money or your insurance. It's a function of the color of your skin. Who gets follow-up care? It's people who can afford to come into the hospital, who can take time off work, who have transportation. Uh, you know, who have someone who, who can look after them and who gets studied and researched, people who trust the medical care system. So we've got incredible inequities. Um, I think I'm running behind, so I'm not going to, I'll go through some of this. Um, ultimately, you know, you've got physicians at this point in time who still refer to trauma patients as, you know, dingbat or knucklehead. Um, you know, they sort of say, well, you know, this is a, a true quote that someone said, not worth my getting out of bed in the middle of the night. And the reality is the doctors who treat trauma patients tend to be nearly uniformly white, male, and highly educated. They come from high socioeconomic status backgrounds, and they're culturally homogenous, especially with regards to risk-taking behaviors. So in other words, they do not understand the mentality of the patients that they treat. So th they don't necessarily value them the same way. Um, even academic neurosurgical centers often have no trauma specialist and the culture of medicine and hospital hierarchies preclude correction because trauma is not something that's perceived as a moneymaker for the hospital. It's generally perceived as, you know, the elective cases are, are, are what's perceived as the moneymaker. And so the people who are doing the, who have the big reputations and bring in the elective cases are, 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 are revered in the hospital system and not the people who speak up for the inequities. Um, so again, independent predictor of rehab is the color of your skin. 
um, you know, minority status is a significant predictor of whether or not you will go to rehab. Um, who gets follow-up care? People who have transportation, a caregiver available, they can take time off work, and it's covered by insurance. Um, who gets studied or researched? Many IRBs deliberately exclude prisoners, pregnant, non-English speaking. Um, there are many um, groups in our society that have historically been abused by the research system. And so they don't trust. Um, even like a few years ago, there was a, a study that was published in a major medical journal um, looking at a randomized, it was a prospectively randomized controlled trial, um, randomizing to early versus late treatment for acute spinal cord injury. You know, and that's something that I don't think you'd ever get that past an IRB in the United States, but they did it in Iran. And, you know, to me, that's reprehensible. If you wouldn't do this to your neighbor, you shouldn't do this to in a neighboring country. Um, people who are educated are more likely to participate in research. Uh, and then it's time, travel, you know, phone and internet service. Not everyone has that. So ultimately, I think that if we have diagnostics and therapeutics that are objective and algorithmic treatments that are unbiased, we will ultimately, hopefully, improve the quality of care. We don't want to bake in the bias. We don't want the AI solutions to tell us that, you know, the reason that these patients are going to do poorly is actually that they're poor. Uh, that, that would be a, an unwanted outcome from, from the use of AI in this setting. Um, the first step is realizing we have a problem. And ultimately, I think these solutions are socioeconomic. Um, we have to have two things. Healthcare has to be uncoupled from employment and insurance companies have to contribute to raising the standards of care. Um, the, the profits at health insurance companies are unbelievably astronomical and they need to share some of that back with society so that you know, other people can benefit from, from the, the quality of care. So a classic example is um, we just came out with a new guideline. I'm on, I'm on the AO Spine Guideline Committee uh, that says that all patients who have acute spine trauma should have surgery within 24 hours. Well, insurance companies actually will pay for it if it's their patients, but they don't pay for it, obviously, if it's not their patient. But the problem is, is that trauma centers don't have time to figure that out, right? So they, they just, you know, if a patient needs surgery, they're going to take them to the operating room and they, they don't get reimbursed for the the ones who don't pay. So then it becomes not in their interest to cover those cases at all because so few of them pay. So perhaps the solution would be that insurance companies support, you know, in, in mass, you know, the fact that trauma centers should be staffed regardless of whether or not the patients are paying. The insurance companies should just pay. Um, and those are the people in my lab. And I think that's it. So I, I'm happy to take questions. I hope. Okay, I, I'm I'm on time because we had 45. This is 45 minutes in. So I will stop sharing. Yeah, timing was great. Thank you. Um, I don't know why my camera's not popping back on. All right. Well, that's weird. Um, Let's see. So I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet, but um, one question which we, you know, kind of started talking about a little bit um, before the, the session, um, you talked a lot about how medical care is going to change to kind of accommodate for uh, the rise in AI and robotics. How do you envision that medical training will uh, have to change for that? Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot less memorization because it's going to be accepted and understood that medical students won't need to know or memorize everything. They will need to know how to access information and utilize it. So hopefully that's a change for the better. Yeah, uh, I guess gone will be the days of uh, sitting and cramming sketchy medical to uh, memorize all the organisms. Yep. Um, uh, another question that I had, so... Um, the eye tracking that you talked about, um, specifically related to BLAST TBI, um, I, it was fascinating to see how you were able to track it with uh, the distance from the injury. And uh, I'm sure you can see the obvious military application to that. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
How do you envision that either eye tracking or um, any of the other biomarkers that you talked about might be used to determine return to combat or maybe even in the, you know, the pre-hospital setting with a, a yeah. young combat medic being able to make that uh, decision if the patient should be transported or not? Yeah. So I, eye tracking is a physiologic marker of the central nervous system function. So it's really valuable because it can tell you if someone's brain is essentially functioning normally or not. And so I think it's, it's going to be extremely valuable in the context you just described, where you're trying to figure out whether or not someone actually has a brain injury or if there's just something else going on. And so I think, uh, I think as a physiologic marker, it's incredibly useful. Some of the other markers, like serum markers, are also useful. They, they're different because they're not necessarily physiologic measures. They are they're molecular measures. So they tell you about the nature of injury but they don't necessarily um, tell you about the, um, the, ex the extent of physiologic disruption. So it's a different sort of information, also valuable, but just different. Um, I see there's a question in here. How do I see litigation for errors changing with AI involvement in diagnosis and pro prognostication? I think this is a fantastic question. And actually I gave a talk to a bunch of lawyers who had a, they basically had an hour long session on that. Um, you know, because who's ultimately liable? Is it the company that makes the technology? Is it the physician that's using it? And, you know, I think that's a really great question. I think that these are, these are subjects that will be explored in the future and you guys will, will have the opportunity to see how that unfolds. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and it was really interesting to hear how you were able to tie together the socioeconomics and the future policy uh, implications for this. Um, yeah. You know, in, I guess, diving a little bit more into that, um, how can we, you know, as maybe the future designers of some of these algorithms, be conscious of bias and how that might uh, influence our design? Yeah, that's really important because, you know, for example, there's like the frailty index, you know, where mm -hmm. people who are frail and have spine surgery do a lot more poorly than people who are robust, particularly at older ages. And um, what this means is, well, people do better and sicker people do worse. And so this means we're not gonna give people a chance. And wellness is a function of wealth. You know, it's, it's a function of nutrition and exercise and exercise equals time. And, you know, some people work and they, they don't have an opportunity to exercise. The social determinants of health have a huge impact on, on wellness. And so that's economics. And that's not, that's not fair. And it, if it is going to factor in. You know, it, it may not show up in eye tracking, but it will show up somewhere else. Uh, and, and we have to be careful that we use measures that are, that are not based, that are not surrogates for wealth. Because that's, that's why our health system is doing so poorly right now. You know, right now, the color of your skin is one of the biggest predictors of outcome after brain injury. And, and socioeconomic status is, is also a huge predictor. And that's, that's not good. That's why we need to change the healthcare system. Absolutely. Um, of course, any questions in the, uh, on the net, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, one last question for me. Um, you mentioned briefly, uh, you know, injury prevention, um, and I know that's important to you given your, your role in Think First. Any yeah. um, thoughts that you have about how AI and, you know, robotics might be applied to that? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, the, the people who are most focused on that are obviously the youth sports crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, I think sports has become a lot safer as there's increased recognition of the chronic effects of neurotrauma. And, hopefully that trend will continue. I don't, I think that what people need to understand is that just because we can quantify the, the impact of brain injury doesn't necessarily mean that we can quantify the benefit of sport. And so we may be throwing the baby out with the bathwater and people, for example, will leave sports because they're so worried about brain injury. And there are lots of kids who are told, oh, you can't play football, you can't play hockey, you can't play you know, whatever. And, uh, and, you know, th that child may be unsuitable for track or crew or whatever this, you know, his or her parents want him to play. And um, 
And so you end up having a child who, rather than playing some sport, plays no sport. And, you know, then they end up long term. There, there's a lot of studies that show that ultimately, if you're not an athlete at age 17, your likelihood of becoming one at age 35 is substantively lower. And so you're, you're condemning a child to, to a lifetime of sedentary lifestyle, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, you know, and the concordant risks associated with that. And those are the bigger risks for dementia. So, you know, the, the question is, is, is your child at greater risk? For, you know, take your average 15 year old. Are they at greater risk for dementia from playing football or not playing football? And I don't think we know the answer to that question. What we do know is that there are ways to make football safer. You know, you can change the rules. You can do tackle bar instead of tackle. You know, there, there are ways to make sports safer. And I think we're, we're starting to understand those. AI will have a role in that because you can put sensors on kids. You know, NFL uses sensors already in the pads. And so they know which maneuvers are most likely to result in brain injuries. Christy Yarbagast, who's a biomedical engineer at Penn, is the head of their program where they, they put sensors in the pads and they, they analyze the data. And as far as I know, they don't even publish it. They just sort of analyze it and maybe they're planning on publishing it in the future, but, but they have a big research program. And so they can change the rules and they can make things safer. And that's, that's basically using large data sets, um, multiple impacts, multiple players. Um, so I think sports will become safer. Um, other, other causes of brain injury, cars are already becoming safer. So cars used to be the number one cause of brain injury in uh, most states. Now it's falls in, in many states. And that's because cars have become safer, but people have not. So, uh, you know, obviously there's an opportunity for AI to impact automobile safety, bike safety, um, you know, other types of, of preventable brain injury type scenarios. Yeah, I love that line. Cars have become safer, but people have not. That's uh, that's a really great one. I might have to steal that, and uh, I'll make Absolutely. sure to Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I see uh, maybe one last question for the evening. Uh, what aspects of healthcare do you think will be least impacted by AI? Oh, that's a really good one. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, certainly not radiology, not pathology. I, I would say the physical mechanical specialties, you know, the hands-on stuff, robotics is going to be huge, but you're still going to need a surgeon. You know, the, what about the, like the diagnosticians, like the neurologists and the pediatricians, you know, that's, they're not quite ready to be replaced yet, but, you know, ultimately they will be. Um, it's a really good question. Like what kind of doctor should you be if you don't want to be replaced by an algorithm? Um, well, I like what I do. I'm a neurosurgeon, but you know, I, I, I don't want to say that that's, that's the going to be least impacted. Cause I, I honestly don't know the answer. I think it's a great question. Yeah. And I'm sure so much of that will be influenced by, you know, policymakers and how, uh, AI ends up being regulated. Yeah. I think it's a lot easier to envision a world where, you know, you get a pathology image or a radiology image read by a computer, but losing that interface with a human surgeon might be more challenging to envision, at least as of now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's well, very interesting. Um, thank you for that. It felt like I got to sit through a, you know, 45 minute Ted talk, which um, is always great. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just thank you for <laughs> taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Take care. You too. Bye.